I don't have that slowdown because um, that F-35 install is, is on a schedule and we want to stay on time. Liz Rains with KTVA again. A uh, question about Port McKenzie and the Port of Anchorage are both in need of repairs. Wondering how important those ports are to the military and if you see any opportunities where military funding could be used to boost those. <laughs> well, I can, uh, I can comment on uh, the Port of Anchorage, which as you had indicated is a, what we call a strategic port. And, um, and I'm aware that uh, the um, city of Anchorage um, and others are trying to uh, invest uh, to sustain the facilities there for a, you know, a long period of time. Uh, but I'm not aware of uh, any uh, military DOD or Department of Homeland Security direct involvement uh, in that project uh, at this point. So to get back more onto your question, it's a, a significantly strategic port for the military. Um, one, because we get goods and services that come and go from that port, and we're able to deploy. Um, General Owens uses it frequently to deploy his, his forces um, via, via the maritime um, medium. Um, and then we also um, get um, many of the goods and services that actually travel into the interior. Once they're offloaded at the docks, they get on a train and they go north. And so um, it's a significant strategic um, capability for us in the military to be able to continue what we do in Alaska. And then um, a much you know, broader perspective is it's a significantly important port for the, the citizens of Alaska given um, the amount of uh, consumables that the state consumes uh, comes through that port. Uh, more, moreover, uh, less, or sorry, less uh, than the airport, for example, much more comes via sea than it does by air. I'd like to add that we brief all the congressional delegations and the staff delegations that come through our headquarters. Uh, we brief them on the importance of the port and how we need that port for, uh, for strategic deployment. Andrew Kitchman, Alaska Public Radio Network. For General Hummel, um, there was a description during the hearing of the uh, ethical fitness uh, training that's been going on. Are you satisfied with the progress that's occurring on um, ethical issues and should Alaskans be uh, assured that the conditions that led to the sexual harassment concerns earlier this decade, uh, that they're resolved and, and that things are on a good situation? So first of all, I'd like to address the, um, the initiative of uh, ethical fitness. And the idea uh, came from the um, Secretary of Defense at the time, Secretary Carter's concern of um, kind of serial misbehavior on the part of very senior officers. And there were a bunch of cases at once uh, where there were three and four star generals who were behaving improperly. And uh, the secretary said um, what concerned him the most is what were the conditions that might have led to, to this at such a, a, a senior rank. And so he stood up <clears throat> kind of a little think tank um, that was headed by Rear Admiral Peg Klein uh, a former commandant of the Naval Academy, and uh, he challenged military leaders to think about ethical fitness just like we think about physical fitness. So you don't do two push-ups a year and that's it. Um, physical fitness is something you train for every day, and so um, being courageous and making uh, the correct statements and correct actions and policing one another is something that we need to train for every single day. And uh, I was very inspired by, um, by the Secretary Carter and, and Admiral Klein's commitment to, being, to, to this, uh, this nascent um, movement of ethical fitness. And so... I just uh, brought it back home and talked to Chaplain Cook and talked to the senior enlisted leader, um, Command Chief Master Sergeant Paul Nelson, and said, we need to figure out how to create a curriculum without adding anything else to our training kit bag. This needs to become a part of who we are. And then as we move along, we are going to become um, a more a more ethical, a, a, a legal, a moral 
um, in, a group of individuals who have the, the character and the courage to help one another stay on a straight path. Uh, I'm very encouraged by the changes that have been made over the past uh, two years since uh, our new leader team has come on board. And I would encourage every Alaskan out there not to take my word for it, to find an Alaska National Guard soldier or airman who is your neighbor or your friend and ask them how they think things are going. And we would invite uh, visits, uh, even if we have to dispatch someone to get you uh, and escort you on base after June 6, to come and talk to our soldiers and airmen and see how they feel about uh, the environment in which they train and operate every day. Liz Rains with KTVA again. Um, we, we, you had talked earlier about the growing concern of a uh, threat from North Korea and wondering, should the U.S. reopen the naval station at ADAC? Um, great question. Um, we, you should probably pose that to the chief of naval operations. <laughs> um, but I will tell you, I lived on ADAC as a child. My dad was stationed there. He was U.S. Navy. And so I have fond memories of my time there in Alaska in, in ADAC, but um, probably more a question for um, the Chief of Naval Operations than, than for us, but I don't know if you have an opinion, Mike. You know, I often uh, get asked, um, what are the Coast Guard and Navy needs for uh, deep water ports uh, in Alaska? Uh, ADAC is not, a, not necessarily a deep water port, but it's a, in a strategic location. and. Uh, I had briefed the committee earlier today on uh, oil spill response, and that's an example of where we have, um, through a commercial company, uh, oil spill response capability at a strate strategic location for the many thousands of commercial ships that, uh, that uh, transit through Alaskan waters uh, every year. Um, but with regard to a deep water port, uh, we are currently working with uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Navy to uh, to define what the Coast Guard's uh, potential future needs for a deep water port in Alaska might be, and uh, I don't yet you know have that that information, but that's something we're working on. Um, Nat Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. I guess I'd follow up on that question a little bit and ask: um, Have have you guys had any indications from? Washington that um, sort of Arctic strategy and uh, Arctic development and Arctic investment are going to be priorities of this new administration. I'm curious sort of what you've heard and seen about that so far. Oh, so there's a new Arctic strategy that um, was just released um, not too many weeks ago. Um, so um, that's one indication. Um, I know the Air Force is doing a um, um, symposium this fall um, where, whereby uh, many of the senior leadership of the Air Force will be traveling, traveling around the um, Arctic. So there'll be a period of time in Alaska, we'll have some time in Canada, and we'll also have some time in Greenland. And the focus will be uh, what are the strategic implications of um, the differences in the Arctic that have occurred over the last few years. And I talked about it in my brief. I don't know if you got to see it, but um, because of the recession of the sea ice, there's a lot more human activity. Well, there's certainly military implications to that. And so the Air Force will be discussing that. And I'm sure the other services um, are having similar discussions. But um, th those are my indications that um, the, the, the U.S. government um, is uh, taking the Arctic um, seriously. Um, one of my bosses, which is uh, General Lori Robinson, the Nor Northern Command Commander, her, one of her responsibilities is to um, husband the, the Arctic strategy for the U.S. military, and she's doing that. So I'd like to add, Nate, that, um, you know, as the National Guard writ large has major equities in homeland security and uh, just as General Wilsbach mentioned, with the many changes in the Arctic to include um, just more traffic, more people, uh, the opening of resources, we have to uh, we have to up our game uh, for emergency response capability, as well as uh, all the ways that we assist with uh, the Homeland Defense Mission. And so, uh, in, in the Alaska National Guard, we determined that we were underrepresented um, on Department of Defense working groups 
who are charged with creating policy and uh, for operations in the Arctic. And so uh, I have a, a newly formed joint staff uh, that uh, very assertively secured membership uh, on the OSD, the Office of Secretary of Defense's Arctic Strategy Working Group. And we also now have a seat at the table uh, at U.S. Northern Command's uh, Arctic Capabilities Working Group. And so we want to make sure that Alaska and Alaska National Guard is recognized as a stakeholder and that our interests are taken into account when, when we craft policies and identify requirements. And, and to that end, um, the Alaska National Guard invited um, uh, eight other states to come to Fort Wainwright and Utkiavik in January, and we have formed the National Guard Arctic Interest Council. Um, it is a group so far of nine states, mostly along the northern tier, um, who are interested in um, being pri a primary developer for National Guard Arctic uh, capabilities and Arctic policy. And so we were elected president uh, in initially, the president of the National Guard Arctic Interest Council. Uh, Maine is the vice president and uh, we, are, we are holding meetings, um, virtual meetings uh, right now after our, our uh, initial conference and we are developing recommendations and policy to send to our boss, uh, our resourcing boss, the Chief of National Guard Bureau uh, for consideration by the um, Department of Defense. I'll add from the Coast Guard perspective, so for the past uh, five years, uh, really much longer, the U.S. Coast Guard has provided both a military and a civil uh, presence uh, in Arctic waters, uh, U.S. Arctic waters. And, um, and we intend to do so uh, this coming summer. That's a seasonal mobile presence, meaning we put cutters and deployable aircraft and uh, shoreside uh, personnel to support them. And, um, and I can tell you that, uh, for, again, from a Coast Guard perspective, uh, we intend to sustain the current uh, level of activity uh, pending any you know, adjustments that may come from the Department of Homeland Security or from above. Uh, but I have not heard, to answer your question uh, directly, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, direction at this point with, which would cause us to change our current course. Liz Rains with KTVA. Are we still safe from base closures in Alaska? So if, if I might um, speak for all of my members, and of course they'll, they'll, my fellow members, but um, none of us are hearing anything about base closures uh, from our leadership. Guys, hearing anything different? I'm not. None of us are. Thank you all for attending, and uh, we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.